Hey, hi everyone. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, pens a little bit. Uh, eventually, everything that I'm talking about, it's not up on my GitHub yet, but it will be there. Um, and my GitHub links to like places you can email me, so if I don't put it fast enough, you're welcome to harass me over email and ask me where I'm putting it up. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about like some of the motivation for pens and why we need something like that. So why, why do we need to build Python? So I'm gonna cover some of the stuff that Cindy covered a little bit in her talk. So when you deploy Python, right, like the, um, way people use to deploy is by pip install, right? You kind of SD your code, and then you ship over the tarball to some other com computer, and you pip install minus other requirements, and you unpack it, and then you do Python setup install. And you know, it kind of works most of the time if you have a build system, and you have internet, and you have lots of other stuff, so you know, it really doesn't work all that well. So you know, um, you can deploy via virtual env, you know, it's more or less the same uh, situation, right? But at least now you kind of pack your virtual env locally, you build everything and you unpack. So now you still have to like move the tarball around and unpack it, but so it works more, but you still have to worry about unpacking the tarball and like weird race conditions and it's kind of annoying. Right, so what's the dream? Why right, the dream is that like I have some magic command, it produces one file, I move that one file over, I don't have to do anything on the target machine. Right, so that's um, kind of, where we want to be. Well, so luckily we, we live in a dream world, right? We have packs. Uh, literally, you can just build one file, you ship it over, and you don't do, have to do anything, unpack or anything on the target machine. That's nice, right? That's, that's cool, right? It makes deployments a lot easier. Um, so how does packs work? I'll kind of be fairly quick because Cindy already kind of talked mostly about that. Um, but basically, if you just run Python and you have a zip file, then what it does uh, is two things, right? It first adds that zip file to the system path, and then it runs under the main under under py from uh, that file. Um, so zip files are weird, right? In that they can have arbitrary prefixes, because uh, for historical reasons, zip looks at the end of the file to figure out like the metadata. Uh, mostly it was uh, for so people can uh, have like multi-part zip archives back when you use floppies, so it's really really historical. I know when was the last time you used a floppy. I don't know when was the last time I used a floppy. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so zip files can have arbitrary content uh, prepended. Um, so in this case, you pretty much just have to you, what you have to prepare. Sometimes like you'll prepare a bit more, but you can literally just prepare user bin and Python. And that's it, right? Like uh, when you prepend like a shebang file, then it uh, it runs Python. It runs basically Python with your text file, which is actually a zip file with like arbitrary content prepended. It will add it to the system path. Um, there is some uh, some more magic that will happen internally in PEX if you have. Um, files that uh, like SO files, it will kind of unpack them and put them in the right place and fix up your system of paths and do a bunch of magic. So that's not everything that Pex needs to work, but those are kind of the main kind of magical parts. The main parts is like, I remember the first time I saw a file like that, I'm like, how does that even work? How can it be? Right? Like, whoa. And I thought we kind of like custom patched our Python to do stuff right, until I actually read up. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, so uh, PEX limitations that it still needs um, the core Python, so it assumes that you already have Python installed on your machine, and it's kind of working. And again, uh, uh, maybe I'll say a few words about the data, but it mostly assumes that Python is available uh, in your path. Right, which means if you have a weird Python stashed away in like opt slash my stuff slash my awesome Python, it's not gonna find it unless you kind of like start hacking your path. Although well, you can do stuff about it. And if you have shared libraries, PEX will still uh, need to find them, right? So you kind of get away from like the Python level dependencies, but you still need system level dependencies. Like uh, the classical ones are like libssl, if you need to do anything with SSL, which if you're doing anything that involves communication, you do unless you enjoy other people reading your stuff. Um, libffi, uh, because if you use any kind of uh, C module that, you know, is like modern, right? Because basically the C Python extension API is pretty much uh, a legacy API, 
uh, at this point because it doesn't support PyPy. So if you want to write a C module that will actually work with all the interpreters that you want, then you probably want to use CFFI. CFFI uses libffi. So it's pretty much essential for any reasonable module. So um, um, th those are like the two popular libraries that you have to somehow shim in to your uh, your system. Luckily, they're like half a reasonably stable libraries. If you put them on a the system uh, in advance, you don't have to patch them that often, except for you know whenever libcell comes with another security patch, so it kind of works. Um, okay, so now that so now we kind of at least believe that like you know building Python is possible, right? Meaning like you can shove a lot of sources and produce one file and move it, right? You can do it with specs directly from the command line, and I'll even talk a little bit about like when and how to do that, but um, you can also use an advanced build system which understands dependencies and can build multiple PEX files because you probably have a lot of different things and they probably want to share some code. Um, so PENS is basically a dependency-based uh, build system, uh, like Make, but written in Python without the weird stuff about Make. Um, so this is how you run it. Um, goals is like the uh, simplest commands because it doesn't assume that you have anything. It just will list what kind of goal you can uh, give pants. The answer is uh, a lot of them. I never remember all of them. I don't think a single human being ever remembers all of them. There's like really kind of like you know weird corner case which like is often very useful, like test changed, uh, which will only test the stuff that's changed since like a given revision. So there's all kinds of like you know nifty stuff that it can do for you. Um, and basically, it doesn't matter where exactly you run pants form, as long as you do it under some directory that has a file named pants. So basically, the root is always be, gonna be where the pants is, and that's important because it means pants has to be named pants. Well, that's actually not true, but it's close enough to being true. And you probably want it to be true because otherwise you'll confuse yourself. So you cannot name it my pants or your pants or you know, whoever's pants or like nifty build system, you, you want to name that actual, the actual string pants. Um, so I guess uh, even if you don't think you ever need to build Python, uh, I, you know, you probably don't like having bugs, so you want to test it. Uh, pants will test it for you. Um, here's, um, so I have a rule in my life, whenever I give a talk about tests and it involves testing, uh, none of my tests will ever work. They will all have bugs in them. That's because the most interesting thing about a test is when it fails, right? So you want to see how a test failure looks like. Um, in general, that's kind of like, you know, because it's so easy to get into a situation where you think you're testing, but all your test failures go into a log file and like your output is empty and you think you're running tests and you actually are running tests, but you never know when stuff is failing. Uh, so. The running test is mostly theoretical at that point, other than like consuming a lot of CPU. Um, so I assert that one equals two. Um, and you can see that I have an assertion error. One is, in fact, not equal to two. It's a big surprise for everyone. But that's, that's basically how testing works. Um, pants can run your stuff directly. It's usually not that useful, although it's sometimes useful for uh, testing purposes. And I'll talk more about how to write something that it will run. It can run, but uh, it doesn't have to just build. It can run stuff directly. Usually more useful to make sure that you set up your targets correctly and that everything is properly set up. So if you want to quickly test out your DAG, that I'll talk a, a little about how you write it or your pants configuration file, and to make sure that this actually works, this is actually a very useful command. Um, and again, like sometimes you want to use that in say your test suite, right? Like maybe the Python test is very good for like, in, like uh, unit tests, but um, on some system you want to actually run your integration tests, pants one is pretty nifty for that. So it, it sometimes does come in handy uh, when you're using pants. But kind of the raison d'etre, right? Like the thing that pants would not exist if it didn't do, uh, well, it actually was originally built to build Java, but let's ignore that and kind of assume we live in like a decent universe where people build Python. Um, so the, the thing pants wouldn't exist if it didn't do um, for the purposes of our talk is it builds a binary, right? So you say Python binary hello, and you need to have enough stuff to kind of actually say have the string hello world printed to the screen, but it will build a PEX file for you. You'll put it in a directory called this that you probably want to put in your .git ignore or your, your .hg ignore. And if you run that PEX file, it will print hello world. 
And so, you know, that will be the file you put in your stuff, right? Regardless of what stuff you're using, right? Maybe you use an RPM, maybe you use a Docker container, but that will be the output that you send to like the next level of, of build, whatever your, your build artifact looks like, or you put it in an artifact directly, again, depending on your specific deployment environment. Um, so a few words about the actual history, not the made up history. Um, so it's loosely based on Blaze, which is uh, a Google thing. Um, it was written at Twitter. Uh, it was adopted by Square, Medium, and Foursquare. I guess Square and Medium have like some foundational relationship to Twitter. They kind of share random sets of founders. Uh, Foursquare doesn't share, as far as I know, any set of founders. But uh, the nice thing is that all these companies, together with Twitter, basically jointly control Pants, which is kind of nice because it's not controlled by any single corporate entity. Um, so. As I mentioned, uh, it discovers the roots by looking for a file named pants. That probably means you do not want arbitrary file named pants elsewhere in your... It probably won't get confused because hopefully most of the time for CI reasons and for usual production reasons, just run stuff directly from the root of your Git. Uh, mostly what it means is if you have like a really weird um, monorepo, where some of it should not be built with pants, or like you know, kind of it has like other stuff, say like images or stuff that's like you know really not related. You can you don't have to put pants as the root of your repo. You can put pants at any layer where it kind of like sees everything below that. Um, that's probably useful in a very low percentage of cases, but kind of just for the sake of completeness, pants doesn't really care about like your kind of Git repo. It cares about where it finds the name pants. Um, so there's a few ways to kind of actually get pants up and running on your system. Like I mentioned, it's not just for building Python, it's also written in Python. Um, so we already talked about how to like, de deploy Python, right? Uh, so you know, kind of let's, let's repeat what we said earlier, but apply it to pants, right? So you can use virtualenv, you know, you know, virtualenv something, and then maybe install pants, and it will, like, I think maybe, I think the package name is not called pants because it conflicts with something in pip, so it's called pants build pants or something like that. But, I have, I have the instructions written here somewhere, but I have better instructions written here soon. Um, so you can do that. Um, uh, like every really uh, serious system, uh, we, can, we also provide the ability to curl by bash, uh, because as everybody knows, if you can't curl by bash to get your stuff installed, I'm not like really serious about stuff. Um, yes, uh, uh, I guess I, I, I don't really apologize because you have to have it, but don't do that for the love of God. Like, don't stop curling by bash, right? Like, um, or uh, you can use pecs, right? Here you don't want to use pants, right? For like the obvious reason. If you had pants, you just use already using it pants, right? Like you didn't know, if you had pants, you didn't need to install pants. You just would be using the pants you have, right? Um, but you can use pecs to build pants. Uh, and let's kind of like think through how that scenario would work. Um, I think the official documentation has something on that. I think mostly the official documentation considers the first two things, which like I hate, so uh, I don't like them. Um, uh, some of it does talk about PECs, and let's kind of think about how we... Um, so kind of to disclaim, this is where I kind of like go off from like the official documentation, and I'm teaching you something that looks like the officially blessed, so uh, feel free to read the official docs. Uh, I want to explain why I'm, I'm kind of uh, um, uh, diverging from the official documentation. So I'm like a big believer in reproducibility, right? I believe that like the same source, the same Git SHA, should lead like to the literally the same bits. Um, mostly at that point, it's a religious belief in the sense of I've never seen it actually happen in reality. Right, so it's, it's kind of an aspiration, but I, 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 I think we should kind of aim for that. That's like clearly the nirvana that we should aim for, and ideally we, we want to make steps to that, uh, right? And it starts, you know, like healing starts inside, right? Like before you can deal with like how you build other stuff, you need to make sure that you build the build system in a way that's reproducible, otherwise um, your, your build is not the same. And um, it sounds like, you know, kind of highfalutin and philosophical and stuff, um, so uh, to kind of explain, to, to kind of convince you maybe that I'm not just kind of like a weird philosopher, um, we actually have the production bug in Square, where someone uploaded a new version of PyTest, 
there was like this weird dependency graph that depended on something, that depended on something, that depended on like various versions of PyTest, and uh, somehow the resolution without that version of PyTest worked, and with that version of PyTest did not work, and we had to kind of fix other stuff in pants. We actually had like a, um, an emergency release of like core pants because it exposed the problem. And it's fine to have bugs in pants, right? The problem is not that there was bug in pants. The problem is that the, that bug was exposed without our control. Like we literally tried to build l the same exact thing we wanted to build yesterday, the same Git hash, and we could not build it anymore. And, and in some sense, that build was forever last to the world, right? We had to upgrade our pants, which means we upgraded our build system, which means we could not make sure that the output is the same output as what we had before. So kind of that, that kind of horrifies me because it means you don't have any, you know, if people ask for like literally the same thing, like I lost my binary, can you reproduce it? No, there's no way for me to reproduce it. Um, and that was a change that, that happened in the world that was not under our control. So it actually happened like in production, so I'm like completely traumatized by that. And so what I'm teaching you is kind of like as a way to kind of heal the trauma. Um, and hopefully prevent that trauma from happening to you in your production environment, right? That's even more important than like, you know, kind of my, my personal psychological issues. Uh, so... Why was Sorry? Why was in production at all? Um, so pants... Pants depends on uh, PyTest internally, because um, if you remember, do do do. So pants depends on PyTest, so when you try to build pants, it builds PyTest, it couldn't build it. Right, so we could not build for production stuff, right? So uh, let's go back, okay, cool, good question. Um, so this is how you'd get a reproducible install. Like you, like there's like two, three parts, where like the bootstrap, uh, which means how you get to a point where you can create a reproducible install. Then there's like the reproducible install, the, how do you build it reproducibility? And then how do you re-vendor? Like at some point you probably do want to upgrade to the latest version. We just want it under your control, whether it's under the control of like, you know, kind of the world, right? That's not under your control. Um, so the only thing you have to kind of bootstrap is just add the source uh, the source for pip, you can literally hard code. Any version of pip will do for that stage. Eight is a pretty good version. Uh, but literally I could put in seven and like this, the, the, the rest of the, the talk would happen um, pretty much the same, but like one would not happen pretty much the same. So I think I, I, I kind of assume like seven or more, but it doesn't really matter exactly which version. Eight is good enough. Um, so assuming that I have uh, already all the, um, all the tarballs archived, I literally can just use the pex command line to, uh, I, I install pex from like a local tarball, then I uh, use it to build pants, and then I run pants, right? And I check if I have pants. Um, in, in, in practice, like, you know, I obviously like try to kind of shove my code on the slide, and even to do that, I had to do horrible stuff to the code, like, you know, delete the imports and, Kind of have, you know, define like a variable called CC so that like it actually will fit on a slide. Like the things you have to do to code to fit on a slide are not probably things you actually want in in, in production. Um, among other things, you probably want to make sure that you that if you revendor, you automatically like you know re, uh, remove pants so that like you know if you kind of do a git pull, you automatically uh, rebuild pants. But that's kind of beside the point, and I don't want that script to be longer than it has to be to kind of get the message across that you can just build pants when you need it. Um, and then what you want is a script called revendor, which means get me the latest versions of everything, right? Like you don't even need a requirements.txt because when you get the latest version, you probably just want the latest version of everything, right? Like anyway, you'll test it, right? Like, you know, it'll be like, um, so this part actually like just, um, uh, for it, it, you'll notice that it first upgrades pip itself, and then it uses pip. The reason, again, is like that pip 1.1 is not command line compatible with pip 7. Pip 7 is sane, so, or, you know, or above, so it first upgrades pip so that you can use uh, the download command and like the right arguments to no binary so that you actually get like all the uh, sources installed. And then the part two is actually the part that deals with git. So the idea is you do it on a branch, it will run the right git commands for you, then you put your stuff up for review, 
Uh, someone notices which versions you use. If they think that this version is particularly stupid, they can, you know, comment on the pull request. You can have a, you know, wh whatever review process you follow in general, you can follow for that re-rendering. And when everybody agrees that this is a good change, you merge it in, you fix a bug, and again, you kind of follow. So the idea is that like you upgrade the same way you do any other source code changes. Right, that's kind of the, the philosophy that like changing the dependencies is just another kind of source code change. Mostly other people's source, but it's still a change that impacts your stuff. So that's kind of like how I like to build pants so that like you don't depend on the internet at build time. You only depend on the internet when at revendor time, right? So if the entire internet is down except your site, then you can still run stuff, right? Like you can still rebuild, right? You just won't be able to upgrade. Um, Pants has a built-in server. It's actually pretty nifty uh, to be able to see uh, what happened, right? You, it's literally just like an HTTP server. It will give you the uh, URL. So you can, depending on your terminal, you can probably right click or click on enough buttons or other weird stuff to actually get it to show up in your browser. And this is like the kind of screenshot you can actually like click in and look at logs and stuff like that, which is a pretty nice thing to kind of just have Basically, like, you know, if I'm using pants, I'm just going to have one tab open to the server. So that if there's a problem, it's actually nicer than starting to kind of grab for logs, like, down in my command line. I'll just, you know, click through stuff and be able to watch and browse. Right? If you have a proper setup, right, like on a CI system, you can literally run the server right there, and people can click in and see, you know, probably want a proxy and, like, you know, protect it. But that's kind of like a nifty thing that you can do. Um, pants I and I. That's kind of like a really weird thing about pants um, that surprises people, right? Because, you know, you start using pants, you're like, I'll just use pants, right? Like, if I need to change later some defaults, I'll change later some defaults. Let me start using it and build some hello world and see that everything is working. So you need to start with pants I and I. It can be empty, but if you don't have pants I and I, just nothing will work. It's kind of weird, but uh, you just get used to that. And anyway, you'll probably have local configuration, so it's not like a huge deal. It's just like a little bit of a stumbling block if you start using that. Uh, so it has to be there. Um, basically, and this is kind of another weird thing about the documentation, if you look for what can go in Pansa and I, you will not find anything about that. The reason is because um, basically Pansa and I is just a weird way to feed, to feed default um, command line options into pants. So that's kind of this mapping that after you use pants a while, you can know it's not well documented, unfortunately. Um, pull requests, I'm sure, uh, are happily accepted. Um, and if you really stumble onto that, you can kind of, I guess, ask me or any of the other person who, any other person who has used pants for a while. But basically, the idea is that if you think there's a command line uh, parameter, that you know you probably want everybody to use pants the same way. You just put it in the pants I and I. So it's kind of weird, but once you get used to it, it's kind of a, again like a, a pretty easy flow because what it does mean is that it's pretty easy to change, right? Like you know, let's say you want to say, I wish I could, I, I would add that to pants dot I and I. So instead of like you know opening pants I and I in the editor and adding that and seeing what's the effect, you can literally just give that command line option, and if that command line option does what you want, then you add it to pants I and I. So your iteration is actually nicer, and it is nicer to have that mapping. It just kind of would be even nicer if it was easy to understand. Um, so like I said, Pants I and I has to be there. Uh, and the other actually thing is that it will always be used. So Pants, it looks for Pants I and I, it will execute everything in Pants I and I. Now, sometimes you want different builds for different reasons, right? Your, your CI system might put the cache somewhere here, and you want to explicitly tell it, like, you know, the cache is over here on the, on the CI system, right? If you have different CI systems, maybe they'll put caches in different places, you know, that may be not an ideal scenario to be in, but sometimes you have to be in that scenario for, like, unrelated reasons because environments are complicated, right? Or maybe you want to uh, optimize it for, like, speed on development, but for uh, consistency on, um, on, on uh, CI, so you actually don't want to use any cache on CI to make sure that what you build is like, you know, just exactly from the sources, but for development, you're gonna iterate a lot. CI systems just don't tend to iterate. By definition, you build one, and maybe it's not gonna be that similar to the next CI. So 
You might want different systems. Um, so this is how you do it. Um, again, a little bit weird. So what it, what pant config override is, is an environment variable containing a Python string. Um, and that Python, that Python string is supposed to be an array with a list. Oh, sorry, sorry, it has to be a list with like names of other CI, CI files. Um, again, it's kind of complicated, but it means you have like a really nice space to compose from. So let's suppose that you have like two different ways to kind of change the configuration that you sometimes want to apply uh, together and sometimes each one apart, right? So you literally can have like, um, then the, the number of like uh, options you have is basically two to the end of the number of like change to configurations you have. Maybe some of them will be like bad ideas to do, uh, in which case, you know, just don't do that, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, the cost of that flexibility is that like, for the simple case, it's kind of weird, and if you get it wrong, you get like weird error messages. Uh, again, um, you can improve the error messages you get, but it, it, is, it is giving you uh, uh, useful stuff. Um, so an example of what you'd want in PantsDI in is maybe you want to turn PantsD off because PantsD is kind of experimental. It's off by default, but like I guess in this like example, um, you, I assume that you turn it on in the, uh, in the Pants and I. Um, so you've configured Pants and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Uh, and ideally, you already wrote some, you know, say Python code. Um, so that's kind of like a good situation to be in. But you still have to document your DAG, right? If you think about what inputs do you give to like a dependency system, you give it the dependencies, right? That's like the one thing that Pants is not going to figure on its own, right? Like the pan an empty Pants and I actually works fine. I think for like this talk, um, almost all my examples just run with an empty Pants and I. So you literally just need to touch Pants and I. Um, but Pants is not going to guess which sources need to go into which binary, right? It's not visible for it to guess, and to guess it would probably be wrong and random and horrible. Uh, build is how Pants spells the file name that has a DAG in it. It's technically written in Python, but in general, you, you want to keep it like data Python, right? Meaning you basically just, you don't want for loops, silly like, not like weird try, accept, read files, do network calls to stuff. No, like you basically want to keep it to kind of definitions of data structures. Um, so that's where you define like sources and dependencies, sometimes hints, like how exactly do I want this built? And we'll talk about what kind of hints are reasonable to give. Um, so here's a simple example, like no hints, one source. So like, I think like theoretically, the simplest example, because you have to have some Python code. Um, that is like, I guess, the shortest Python code that you can actually see, you know, is distinguishable from nothing, which is print hello world. Um, so that works, right? And if you remember like my earlier, you know, like pants hello, pants run hello, that would actually work, right? If you had that, and then you did pants run hello, it would actually kind of run hello and print hello world, and ideally you'd be happy. Um, that's like extremely useless, by the way, for hello world, because Pants has so much output by default that, that like, you know, you have to know where to find the hello world. But if it does something more interesting than writing hello world, that, that is often useful, like, you know, create a file or something like that. Sorry. Um, so sometimes you want the file not to do anything because you kind of import it for other reasons. But you want when you do pants run to do something, use entry point. Um, those of you who have written entry points in setup UI, it's exactly the same, right? You say module colon function. That function will run with zero parameters. That's like a lot of basically setup tools equivalent of entry points. Um, so that's a different way to print hello world. And I have to say that's like the only reasonable way to really use it. Like that, the other example is mostly so you can just start testing out. So this is a good example of a build hint, by the way. If you're wondering what kind of build hint, that's a build hint, right? It's not a source. It's not a dependency. It's not an output. But it does say, when you build it, build it in a way that runs this function, right? So it's a good example of a hint. A lot of the hints are about at that level. I guess I'm, I'm not sure how much you can extrapolate a level from one example, but as far as you can, that around the 
Um, okay. Uh, so Python library is something that will often surprise people. Like it makes a lot of sense if you already are used to those systems, and it makes zero sense if you're not used to those systems. Um, so I guess the first time, by definition, you're not used to the system, the first time you encounter these things. It does not produce an output. You cannot build a Python library, right? I guess you could probably plug in pants badly enough to make it produce a wheel or something, but that is probably not what you want. So you actually don't want it. it that it does not produce an output is a feature, not a bug. I guess what I'm trying to say, even though it sounds surprising at first. Um, what it is, it is a very good dependency target, right? So let's say that you have, you know, common, right? You know, I think in Twitter you literally have like twitter.common or something like that, and, and most companies will have that, right? Like a large library of all the functions that you always need, right? Um, maybe the things specific to your environment, maybe the things that, you know, Python doesn't have that you, you know, your architect thinks that everybody should have, uh, maybe under reasons, maybe like, you know, you don't have to have it only for common, obviously, but that's a very good example of like why you'd want to have like a large number of things and you basically put them in library that says called common. And then everything, all the binaries would all depend on common. And like when someone adds a function or maybe refactors or something like that, you don't have to change all the dependency graph, right? So that's very useful. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is a minimal example, a small of my examples. So basically, uh, the only thing it has is a library that returns a string hello world instead of hard coding it. That is not useful for anything I can imagine, uh, but it is a good example, I guess except for the use of being a good example. Um, so the Python uh, binary is now named hello bin, so that you can easily distinguish what, what's the bin and what's the lib. And um, you notice that dependency is marked with a colon. Uh, again, that might surprise you a bit if you don't, you're not used to the syntax. Um, the thing before the colon is like the path to the other build file, but often you'll find that like you'll have a lot of dependencies on other targets in the same build file. You don't want to name it because that will be like a very, you know, repeat yourself thing and you don't want to repeat yourself. So um, often you want to use just like naked colons. Um, you give the hello py thing to that and um, off you go, right? And you run the, you build the binary and it prints hello world, which means it's managed to find the greet, right? So it managed to properly import. And that's actually really important, right? Because remember, at the PEX level, right, that this PEX, um, you know, like in this example, like, you know, I just use it directly from, but it's designed to be shipped off to a machine far, far away from the machine you built it, right? So the only way to make sure that this uh, hello.py file is in the PEX is to depend on it. Otherwise, it will not be shipped. So the fact that it works means uh, that this import line worked, right? That it did not fail from hello import grid with saying like, you know, no such file hello py, which means we properly set up the dependency. And the reason I'm kind of stressing that is because this will be the bug you see. Like if you forget the dependency, um, you'll see the bug and that's great, right? Because you, you will not wait until you ship it over there to find it. It will not, not work right here. It's great not to work right here rather than like work fine here and like work badly over there. Right, and the same by the way will be true for run. Even run will already fail. We'll set up sys.pass to only include the files that are, you know, kind of um, dependent upon. Uh, test, right, since the only way you use, are gonna use, you know, uh, um, pants to kind of define your dependencies and all of that, it makes sense to define your test targets uh, there. So you can just run test and then if all the tests run correctly, you run um, uh, binary. It runs tests. It uses PyTest internally. Uh, hence the dependency on PyTest that we discussed uh, earlier in my kind of motivation story. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, none of my tests will ever work. Um, so this is a good example of a breaking test. Uh, this will break. Um, backends. So. Uh, basically, um, Pants is like a plugin-based system, but even internally, it's basically all is made out of plugins. The only difference is some plugins are auto-enabled. Um, but that's a fairly small subset of even the stuff that's built into Pants. Uh, you can enable stuff. For example, 
This will enable you to do a Python check, which does runs like all kinds of linters. I don't remember which linter it runs, but one of those. Um, third party pattern, right. So um, you probably are not writing everything that you need in your company. You probably depend on a lot of open source libraries. Right, um, so the third party pattern is a way to kind of uh, make it make sense, right? You can put Python requirements all over the place, but then you have no idea what depends on what, and it's kind of all weird. Um, so the idea is to concentrate all the requirements in one place. Um, so basically you'll have a directory literally named third party. Um, and you can do a bunch of things. You can literally just have all your requirements right there. Um, so you can write the requirement, also the name and the version of the requirements you want right there. So it'll be very obvious when you change, you change. You know, if you want to move to a new version of ANSI colors, you change 102 to 103, you check it in, everything is great. Um, so that's how you depend on that, right? And, and again, the nice thing about it is that the I only need to go to like one directory to make sure I understand, like say, if you have in your company, as many companies do, like a third party approval process, you can also enable it just for this directory, right? Whatever the approval process, right? Like whether it's automated or manual, right? You, like there's only one directory you need to kind of check, right? Like even if it's a human being, like it's really easy to scan and see that like, no, no new third party dependencies, no new third party upgrades, right? Um, so, uh, but this is how you depend on that, right? So this would greet you with like ANSI colors. Um, in this case, I'm just using many sources. Um, you can use globs. I personally am not a huge fan of globs, but I copied this, this uh, example for somewhere, and it's good to know that this exists. I'm more of a fanatic, so I like to kind of actually spell out the names of Python files, but that might be just my you know, kind of OCD-ness and should not impact how you write code. Um, you can use requirements.txt uh, and use Python requirements. Um, I guess the only reason to do that if you already had requirements.txt, otherwise, you know, why not spell it like in a way that's native um, to uh, pants? But if you already had requirements.txt and you want to quickly uh, um, change it, then you can just put very little stuff in your build that basically just says, hey, Figure out where the requirements of TXT files there and just add everything there. Um, it will also give you the ability to do, I guess you can also do it with build, with like having like softer dependencies, right? You could do greater or equals to or between. Of course, that kind of, you know, I guess is like philosophically an anathema to me because that means you're not really sure what you're getting and it's like, woohoo, yellow. Um, you can set up the uh, repositories to be in other places. Um, like, for example, the way that I figured out that this is the Python, um, the correct Python repos line um, to set the repositories is by reading very carefully the uh, dot pants help and then figuring out that this is how you'd uh, uh, change the Python repos. So it takes some practice knowing how to read the, um, the command line options and understanding how to translate them to I and I, but I guess I've, I've had that practice. Uh, so, um, at some point in your life, if you use Pants enough, you'll figure out that Pants does not know everything it, you, you want it to do, right? Build systems are typically complicated and maybe you want to build something else, right? Maybe you have a new language, maybe you have a new kind of target, maybe you want to run checks. Um, so luckily Pants is written in Python, right? So it's not just simple to build Python and it doesn't just build Python, it builds like other stuff. Um, but maybe you need to write, you know, to use it to write even more stuff that you did not anticipate, right? Um, so uh, you write a plugin. There's two plugin types, um, loose and build, and the, the trade-off between them is kind of subtle. So while I'm not gonna talk too much about how to write plugins, because the documentation for that is kind of okay, and definitely beyond my ability to understand like the five minutes I have left, I'm not gonna try that. But mostly I hope that I kind of guide you when you read the documentation to understand what you wanna do. Um, so, uh, a loose plugin, or a loose source plugin, sometimes it's, it's referred to, it basically means that like you have the Python files right there in your source tree, right? Ideally under a reasonable directory, like you kind of make a directory called, say, 
pants extensions and pants plugins, and you put all your Python files there. And then you also have to muck around with paths. Um, the correct way to muck around with paths is not to change your environment variables. Uh, Pants.ini has a way for you to mac with uh, the path that you want to set up. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but you can find it in the doc. That's actually reasonably well explained. Um, the advantage of that is that if you have a monorepo, you literally have maybe it's like a separate team of people changing the, uh, say, Pants extension directory, but it's all the same check-in, right? Literally, like, you know, someone on the build team makes the check-in, every branch from that can use that extension, right? If it was an extension to say, uh, build Rust, then suddenly like you can put Rust in and it will get built and everything is fine. Um, built means that it's built into the pan specs, right? So if you remember, so this, this is kind of like really weird and kind of really comes to like, you know, kind of, I guess, um, philosophical self-referential questions, but um, the thing that's hardest to build is your build system. Because you do not have your build when you're building your build system. Um, so while it's kind of not nice to have loose source, right, and the whole point of Pants is to kind of put all your stuff in like one big ball and know that one, that, that big ball, the PEX file, is everything you need, uh, to get there you need a build system. Uh, to get the build system, if say like some of this ball is building a shared library out of Rust sources and then like plugging it in with CFFI to Python, um, the explanation of how to do that cannot come in that ball, right? Because otherwise, if you change how to build Rust, because you got it wrong the first time, because you always get it wrong the first time, then you suddenly need to rebuild Pants. And like, where would that rebuilding come from, right? So, you know, if it's not an open source project, like, you know, then it's, it makes sense to put in your monorepo if all your code is already on a monorepo. So this is why loose makes sense. Uh, build is, again, like, um, if you, if it is an open source project, right? If someone releases um, a Pants extension to say build Rust, um, you can literally just change your, um, so your thingy that builds Pants to uh, add that as something. And you notice that it'll just add that to the PEX ball, right? It won't enable that. So you'll still need, um, where did I put that? Here you go. You'll we'll still need to explicitly enable that in your Pants INI, which is actually pretty nifty because that means that maybe only some Pants INI will enable that. Again, depending on like exactly why you're doing that, maybe that's a good thing too. Um, but, um, so sometimes it, it makes sense to uh, build your stuff, and sometimes it makes sense to keep it a slow source. It depends a lot on like exactly why you're doing that, right? Is it an open source project? Is it a, pro is it a project with very loose? connection to the, um, to the monorepo, then you probably want to just build it and publish it to PyPI and grab it, or publish it to uh, like a local dev PI and grab it. If it's very tightly integrated and it's the only place that uses it, or it's the first place that uses it, and you want really to quickly iterate because you're sure like, like you're not going to get it right even the third time because you have to keep switching which exactly how to find the Rust compiler, then probably make sense to put it in a, lo in a loose source, even though in general in Pants you prefer everything to be in the PEX ball. Um, so I guess um, that's all I had to say. Um, I guess there are a lot of people who um, are uh, reasonably Pants experts in the room, and even more people who use Pants on a regular basis in a room. Um, so if I get anything wrong, I'm sure that people will be happy to tell you, and to tell me, and if you have any questions, uh, please uh, step up to Mike. Or just ask and I'll repeat your question. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Um, so that's uh, a good question. I think Pants uh, is working towards Python 3 support, but Matt would probably know better than me. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat. Um, so uh, he's saying that we are trying not to break Python 3 compatibility. Nobody is actually working towards um, Python 3 support, but nobody is uh, against using Python 3, right? If you find any incompatibility with Python 3, we'll more than happily accept patches for that. It's not an non, it's, it's not an anti goal. It's just that like the companies currently using um, using Pants are not using Python 3. So nobody is currently working on that. As far as I know, like you know, it's 
very possible this is an electron someone how to work at making a pull request. But so far we haven't seen any pull request. It hasn't been a problem for anyone who's currently been using pants, but uh, we're not against Python 3 compatibility. And if you uh, submit a pull request saying I'm, I'm fixing that compatibility problem with Python 3, uh, there is no reason we won't accept it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. We, we don't want it to break in Python 3. Currently, I'm not sure if we're even testing Python 3 compatibility. But again, if you um, like, you know, add to like the, do we test Python 3 compatibility currently? I don't think so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that, yeah, that, that's uh, important. I, I, I can repeat that, that's fine. Um, so you can build, like not, not, nothing here prevents you from, you know, writing code that, that needs Python 3 and building it with Pants. So the question, I'm assuming the question was not whether Pants can build Python 3 into Pexas because it can do that. It, it has been able to do that since like, you know, a long time ago. The question is like, if you only have a Python 3 interpreter on your system, can you run Pants? The answer is not yet. We probably have some minor incompatibilities. Uh, nobody's currently working on fixing those, but that's certainly not an anti-goal. It's just that it's not a high priority for anyone currently working, and we definitely accept pull requests for that. And that's... Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Any other questions? Uh, going once, <laughs> twice. Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>